Welcome to Calf Academy, your source for calf care education. This section is going to be about sanitation and cleaning in a calf facility. In order to see disease on a calf operation, it's usually one of two things or a combination of both. One is the calf's ability to fight off the disease or the number of disease-causing organisms that are presented to the calf. And these disease-causing organisms are typically bacteria, or viruses, or protozoa. Or it could be a combination of the two. Calf has uh, a low ability to fight off disease, and there's a lot of organisms, which that sets it up for a very difficult management situation. So on the immunity side, uh, we typically think in terms of colostrum at least in the very young calf. And of course, nutrition is a major factor and being able to use a successful vaccination program is also a key piece of the immunity side of the balance. And on the pathogen load side, you know, we're talking about biosecurity, making sure that we keep those types of diseases that come on the farm from other people, other animals that may bring something in from, a, from an outside source. Uh, housing from a pathogen load standpoint is always very important. That's where the animal lives, of course. And then overall sanitation techniques. So we'll spend a lot of time in this presentation talking about things related to sanitation. So sanitation is really about reducing the pathogen load. And one way we can think of sanitation is cleaning and disinfection. We'll get into more of those details here shortly. So let's start with a few definitions first. Um, sanitation in general is the promotion of hygiene and the prevention of disease. And in order to accomplish that, we can use detergent or soap, and they're typically a chemical that attracts and encapsulates dirt, oil, or other soils. And what we're really trying to do is make it easy to remove those sorts of substances from the surface of a bottle or a pail or any other type of um, instrument that we're using around the animals. And then uh, finally, and the definition of a sanitizer is another type of chemical which is used on the surface that, that kills the germs that it comes in contact with. Those are the types of germs that are left after we use detergent or soap. To do an effective job, we need to have a plan. And the sanitation plan has uh, six different components to it. First, we have to assess what types of issues we're dealing with, what types of organisms, for example. The next part of the sanitation plan is actually washing and scrubbing. Third part, rinsing. Then we get into sanitation. And then we have to decide how well did we do. So that's an evaluation. And from that point, we decide what we need to repeat, or do we need to repeat, you know, s simply as needed based on our evaluation. So the assessment part is thinking about what diseases can affect the animal, um, how are they transmitted from one animal to another or to the animal from something else. You know, we think about location, susceptibility to the different types of diseases, and, and we can think about them in terms of viral, bacterial. We talked about protozoal, we talk about vectors. The vectors is something that actually will carry the, the disease to an animal. Flies are a typical one, certainly people are a big vector for carrying diseases, for example, from one farm to the next. We need to think about the equipment that's being used and our ability to just keep other people, other animals, those sorts of things away from the animals that we want to make sure we, uh, those animals that we value. Washing and scrubbing is probably the most important part of our sanitation plan because we have to remove all of the visible dirt, you know, the organic matter like manure and milk, um, oftentimes we'll think of this as just elbow grease, you know, in other words, we've got to put a lot of work into it to get the obvious dirt out of, off from the surface. We can even think about this extra work that we do in washing and scrubbing will accomplish 90% of what we want to do about getting rid of the pathogens and the biofilms that cause us the trouble. So washing and scrubbing is an extremely important part of the cleaning process, and that's where we typically will always start. So as part of our washing and scrubbing, this is where detergents come in. And detergents are something to help the soil get removed from the surface. It makes it less likely to clump together or stick together. 
It also makes fats and oils easier, easy to remove. And then just the mechanical action of what we call our elbow grease helps uh, in the washing and scrubbing process. Oftentimes people will use high pressure sprayers to help with this part of the washing and scrubbing. We have to think about what impact these high pressure sprayers will have on aerosolizing the, the dirt or the organic matter. It can work to be a big uh, problem in spreading these bacteria via the air to other surfaces, maybe stuff that's already been cleaned. So we need to think about using caution when we use high pressure sprayers to help us with our washing and scrubbing process. We talked about washing and scrubbing. We talked about detergents and that physical action of scrubbing, removing dirt. Um, we rinse that part of it away and oftentimes we're left with this thing called a biofilm. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but oftentimes we want to get a sanitizer that will penetrate the biofilm. The biofilm is a, think of it almost as a home for all the pathogens. The bacteria will live within the biofilm. So we hope our sanitizer will be a big part of helping decrease the amount of biofilm that is on a surface. Uh, one thing that could really help us there is just using good old fashioned dry air. Drying the objects is a very critical step in helping control uh, the biofilm buildup. You know, the way that we accomplish some of these things can be different. For example, when we wash nipples, you know, it can be a good idea to just put our nipples in a washing machine and we've got good scrubbing action, we've got detergent. Washing machine can be a real cool idea to be able to clean up nipples. On the slide, it shows the nipples being soaked in a plastic container. Just soaking these bottles and nipples, probably not a good idea. You just don't do as good a job. You don't have the physical action of the, the scrubbing action and those sorts of things. Um, try to avoid just soaking these pieces of equipment. Uh, not very effective. So when you set up your cleaning and sanitation protocols, make sure everything's easy to use easily accessible, have things set up so if something's easy to do, it's more likely to get done, more likely to get done right. Here's another example of storing feeding equipment. If you have a system where you can stack up the pails so they dry really well between feedings, that really is going to help. Just soaking buckets in a bunch of water is not necessarily a good idea to help with keeping these buckets clean. So remember what we said earlier about drying is a critical step in, in helping in our in our whole sanitation process. Here's another example of being organized and how to store things like nipples. You know, have some nice, easy to use clean shelves to be able to line up your nipples and make sure that they're clean and they stay dry. The example on the right in this slide of putting the nipples upside down inside the bottle it doesn't allow for very good circulation of air. It doesn't allow the nipple or inside of the bottle to dry quickly. And uh, you just may get some additional bacterial growth, for example, in a situation like that. Here's another example of a fairly inexpensive storage system for bottles and nipples. You know, again, make it easy to do, make it simple and effective, more likely to get done. As is most things, if we can move milk replacer easily um, around the farm or move the feed, this is another example of really helping the people that do the job that they've got good equipment to work with. So let's start uh, thinking about biofilms. You know, just what are biofilms? A biofilm is something that can form on many different types of surfaces. Um, in industry, it could be on plastic, drainage pipes, stainless steel. In medical, I think one of the better examples of a biofilm is what happens on human teeth when you know they are not brushed properly or you don't use mouthwash the biofilm that builds up on teeth will commonly turn into plaque and then calculus if not taken care of and of course you know we see lots of biofilm on plants and that uh, sometimes when you feel plants that are in water they'll feel a little bit slimy what you're feeling is is a biofilm starting to form this slide shows, you know, different stages of biofilm development. You know, we have cells that float around. They could be bacterial cells. They'll be floating in the liquid. Then they may attach to the side of the, like a water pipe, for example. And if the bacteria attach, then they split and grow and form a colony. And if that colony gets big enough, you know, it becomes extremely hard to eliminate. So, you know, the picture number three where it just shows that the biofilm is almost taken up most of the space in, in this pipe. 
So when we use a chemical like a sanitizer against biofilm, if the bacteria that we're trying to sanitize, we can kill those very easily if they're unattached, um, if they're just floating in the liquid. But if these uh, bacterial cells attach and start to form a colony, it'll take oftentimes a lot more time to be able to inactivate these attached cells. And in this study, courtesy of Penn State, it shows, you know, it takes up to 12 minutes to be able to eliminate these attached cells where it was less than a minute if they were unattached. And of course, if it forms a good thick colony, it may never be able to inactivate all the bacteria that's within the biofilm colony. So the key message here is don't let biofilm build up. You know, use your sanitizers to use your cleaning regularly to prevent the cells from attaching to the side of whatever type of instrument or thing that you have that you're trying to keep clean. Clean frequently and thoroughly. So as part of our, our sanitation plan, we get down to the sanitizing component of this. So when we apply a sanitizer, we want to apply it to the clean and dry surface because the sanitizer is going to be something to kill whatever bacteria might be left there. There are a wide array of different sanitizers and chemicals to be able to use in this area. And, you know, really is good to be able to work with a local supplier that knows their products and how they recommend their use. So a very good resource for learning more about what types of disinfectants are available and how they work and what they're most effective against. I just simply Google disinfectant in Iowa State and the first thing that comes up on that Google search will be a very good resource that they put together on all kinds of information about sanitizing and disinfecting. So we've made it through in our sanitation plan, we've made it through assessment, washing, scrubbing, rinsing, sanitizing and we're up to the point of evaluating just how well did we do in the past we've had to look at evaluation from the terms of you know culture plates and those sorts of things we now have a new tool that uses the term called bioluminescence in other words that what we're doing is looking at trying to assess the level of atp atp is a substance that's in all living cells and even some dead cells atp still will be present and this comes from cells from plants or animals and it takes advantage of the light reaction that we see with the little firefly there's enzymes in there called luciferase and luciferin and when these enzymes react with atp there's light produced just like it is in the firefly and then we'll have a machine that's able to measure that light telling us how much atp and then a good example the more atp the more contamination potentially the more bacteria that we have So the machine that's most commonly used with the people in milk products is the Novalume, and that comes from Charm Scientific. And this machine measures the level of light, and it's reported in the terms called relative light units. And the relative light units for a clean surface on stainless steel is about 1,000, on plastic 2,500, and on rubber 4,500. Keep in mind that Stainless steel is less porous than plastic or rubber. That's why we've got different levels for assessing whether things are clean. So just keep those levels in mind as a rough guideline of what our goal should be on our clean surfaces. So here's some examples of where the Nova Loom was used on various types of equipment. In this example, we can go part way down. We can see the nipple clean, number one, it's rubber. It's an auto feeder and has relative light units of 5,545,000. That tells you it is very, very contaminated. In this particular situation, we took a another nipple that was cleaned. It would measured 46,000. We took another nipple that was rubbed in chlorine or soaked in chlorine that measured zero. Then we took that same nipple and cleaned it with a brush back up to 3 million. So there's, what, what this is telling us is that when 
Biofilm builds up in the rubber, for example, in these nipples. It's extremely hard to clean out of there. You're better off making sure that you do whatever you can do to prevent the biofilm from happening in the first place. And that, of course, as we've already talked about, that's regular and an effective attention to cleaning and sanitizing every day. Here's another example of a contamination in an es esophageal feeder that's being used to provide calves with colostrum. And you can see on the uh, esophageal tube that was used in bulls, we had a 19,582. Now that's plastic, it's certainly not a long ways away from the 2,500 that we'd expect for a plastic service. But it's way, way better than the stainless steel esophageal tube that measured 703,000. So although the stainless steel tube should be a thousand to be clean, this one was very, very dirty. And when the, the same stainless steel tube was cleaned rigorously with a brush, um, it still measured 286,000. So here was, again, as an example, this was a very contaminated piece of equipment and it's very difficult to get clean after it's had that degree of contamination. So things get dirty, there's no doubt about it, but I think we just really need to pay attention of where do we start looking for the dirty things, where do we start looking to how do we clean things, and here are two examples in this slide where the feeding hose is laying on the ground, you know, in the manure, and obviously not a good situation to have a critical piece of equipment like that being treated uh, where it's going to be difficult to clean. The picture on the right in this slide is that same nozzle that's used to dispense the milk. That nozzle was never taken apart to look at the spring and the seals and that sort of thing and within this nozzle. Take all these parts of equipment apart so you can make sure that you do a good job of thoroughly cleaning. The slide on the right is a electron micrograph of a head of a pin and you can see the bacteria that are hanging all over the head of that pin. We can't see that sort of thing with our naked eye, so that's where we use the Nova Loom, that's where we do the swabbing to be able to determine if something's clean or, or dirty. In some situations, like the two pictures on the left, that was extremely poor cleaning, poor sanitation, and you don't need a Nova Loom to determine that those two examples really need a lot of extra attention. So we've got plenty of tools to be able to help us with these assessments, but it still comes down to common sense and really paying attention every day, every day on how we're gonna clean, disinfect, and sanitize. That concludes our topic of cleaning and sanitizing on a CAF facility. Thank you for completing this CAF Academy course. If you have follow-up questions, please contact your Milk Products National Account Manager 